the coming coming, like virtually coming. Um, I appreciate it. Um, I'm Dr. Chris Singles. I'm a uh, neuropsychologist in Newport Beach and in Long Beach. And um, actually, this month is my 40th anniversary in the field. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes, so I started out uh, trained at the University of California, San Diego Medical Center in the Department of Neurological Surgery back in 1982 and um, fell in love with the field. I decided that was my calling and um, that's how I went to spend my whole career and um, went back to Boston where Oh, the, um, Ruben, the audio uh, muted. So, uh, yeah, uh, unmute the audio. There you Welcome. go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I grew up in a little dairy town north of Boston and went back and spent two years at the Boston Veterans Hospital uh, training as a neuroscientist. Uh, uh, and then um, ran a 45-bed brain injury program on Cape Cod, Massachusetts, for three years. And then uh, got called out to run a program in Long Beach that's now owned by Long Beach Memorial Medical Center. Um, spent three years there and then um, 20 years at Saddleback Memorial Medical Center in their rehab uh, unit at Laguna Hills. And then uh, they closed that unit and then the Anaheim Ducks hired me and the Angels baseball team hired me to take care of their players. Uh, so I worked with the uh, Ducks for five years and still work with the Angels. So, uh, you uh, see an angel player getting hurt, usually the catchers, uh, they they come see me and I... Well, you're doing better than the angels. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Yeah, I've heard that a million times. Yeah. So what, what I do now is I have my practice in Newport Beach and Long Beach. Um, I work with the angels baseball team and then I, uh, I'm on a surgical team at UCI with epilepsy patients. Uh, so these are patients that their uh, epilepsy is so bad that they require surgery, so I do the pre-surgical brain mapping and then the um, post-surgical assessment uh, uh, for those patients. So, uh, having, having been in the field for 40 years, I wanted to, um, you know, an hour is certainly not enough time, but I wanted to kind of reflect on what I've learned over the past 40 years uh, as a clinician. And um, um, one of the things uh, I've learned is that, uh, you know, my training was, was great. I, I, I trained with some of the best people in San Diego and then uh, trained with a Dr. Edith Kaplan at the Boston VA, who's a very eminent neuropsychologist. She passed away uh, about 10 years ago. Um, and that was great. I mean, that was fantastic. Um, but honestly, I've learned uh, so much from my patients um, over the years that, uh, that's kind of exceeded all my formal clinical training. It's just seeing thousands and thousands of people and hearing their stories. And, um, and, and everybody, you, you can't like put people with brain injuries in a box together. They're all different. You know, they're all, you know, they all came into the brain injury with different backgrounds. And, uh, and then the circumstances of the brain injury is all different from each other. Um, and so every one of you has a story. And it's, it's usually an interesting story. Um, sometimes it's a tragic story, oftentimes. Um, but the other thing I've learned from my patients is that there's life, there is life beyond brain injury. Um, and <clears throat> I, uh, I never liked the word survivor because survivor is, when I picture the word somebody who's surviving, I, I picture the guy that, you know, that, that's drowning, that, you know, holding on to a log in the ocean and is barely making it. And, and that's true for uh, a number of my patients, but, but I always like the word thriver. <laughs> and thriving is um, taking the circumstances you're dealt with, whether it's your brain injury or, or family issues or uh, substance issues or whatever it is, and, and making, um, making something out of your life in spite of that. Um, and I really um, uh, abide by that model. And the other thing is to, the other thing I've learned from my patients is to uh, never lower the bar for them. 
Like never keep the bar too low because if you, if you lower the bar, whether it's with their behavior or whether it's with their goal setting or whether it's with their um, aspirations, what they want to be and what they want to do, um, then you're, if I do that, I'm, I'm actually disabling you. I'm actually causing you to be more disabled than perhaps you would be. And the reason I know that is like some of the outcomes that I've seen uh, in my patients that surpassed anybody's expectations. Um, my, my, uncle, my uncle Dave, he was in the army. He was in a terrible car crash in France back in the, the early 60s. And um, traumatic brain injury, broke every bone in his body. And um, <laughs> that guy, he's, he's run oil and gas companies, banks, psychiatric hospitals. Um, you know, he's, he's done it all, you know, and he's had a rich life. He's uh, still alive, lives down in uh, east of San Diego. Um, has, uh, his wife is lovely and my aunt and his daughter and he has a granddaughter. And, uh, and it, it's amazing. Um, another patient of mine, um, Tom, I'll use his first name. I guess that's okay, right? HIPAA wise. Yeah, okay. He uh, he runs a disabled sailing program, so he teaches people to sail who have disabilities. He had a traumatic brain injury. Um, another patient who passed away. Um, he reorganized the whole access bus system in Long Beach. Um, he was in a he was a quadriplegic, traumatic brain injury, and he basically advocated for changes in how um, the access system worked in Long Beach and was just an amazing, amazing gentleman. Um, I know you're not supposed to have favorite patients, like, <clears throat> like an ethical thing, but um, uh, one of my favorite patients was back in uh, Cape Cod. Her name, first name was Jeannie, and she was hit by a drunk driver. And um, after her brain injury, part of her recovery is she started going around to all the high schools and giving a presentation to high school students. And she was an actress in Boston. And so what she would do is um, play a film clip or a theater clip of her uh, acting. And she was this lovely, beautiful, blonde woman, you know, just, you know, just very classy. Um, and then she would roll out onto stage in her wheelchair. Um, she had a, a ptosis of her right eye, which is a brain, part of a brainstem injury where it causes your uh, eye to droop. And she had a disarthric voice, so her voice was, you know, hard to understand. But uh, and and she would talk about the impact that the drunk driving had on her uh, her life and her her career. So um, so people can thrive after traumatic brain injury. Um, I think that's really important. And and um, hopefully, in here either directly or virtually, you uh, you get to share your uh, joys and triumphs as well as some of the challenges that we deal with. Um, <clears throat> the other thing um, I've learned um, over the past 40 years has little or nothing to do with my field, my uh, being a doctor, but it's, uh, you know, raising, <laughs> raised two boys uh, who are now young, young men and fathers themselves, um, raised two girls, uh, had the, you know, the uh, joy of, having two girls come into my life but when they were teenagers, uh, when I got remarried, um, I have uh, four grandchildren. Um, and then I have elderly parents. I have an 88 year old mom. Uh, uh, my dad's turning 93 tomorrow, uh, it's his birthday. Yeah. Happy birthday. And they still live on the farm I grew up on in New England and they're still independent. So, you know, I think um, it may sound silly to you, but um, having been a parent, um, um, you know, raising two young men um, who I'm very proud of. One's a paramedic up in Spokane and the other is a uh, behavior specialist uh, in Santa Barbara. Um, they're, they're wonderful husbands and parents. Um, it gives me great joy and it kind of taught me some lessons about, you know, uh, who I am as a father and what I did right, what I did wrong. And, and I think that's important in engaging with patients who come in with family problems or problems with parenting. Um, I was, you know, by no means was I the perfect dad. You know, I made mistakes. But those mistakes are a learning experience as well. And they, 
they help me, they've helped me a lot with my patients. Um, having elderly parents who are, you know, God willing, knock on wood, still healthy and independent, um, it gives me a lot of patience um, that uh, I didn't, I certainly didn't have when I started out in this field when I was 25 years old. Um, I actually turned 65 this year. I'm, I get to go on Medicare in August. And so I'm really excited <laughs> about that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but you know, one of the things, one of the things I've learned um, as, as a neuropsychologist is the, the relationship is much more important than the tests that I use or the, um, you know, the uh, data that I collect and everything. Uh, because if you don't start out with a relationship with the patient, then it's not going to go well. You know, it's, um, and, and to really try to connect with patients as, as people, not as data sets or diagnoses. Um, I, I never liked it. Uh, I, I used to have to do rounds way back when, when I was at the VA. And we'd walk into a room and this very eminent neurosurgeon would walk in kind of looking like me with the suit and everything. And he'd say like, this is a uh, left parietal subdural hematoma with a shearing effect and all that. Ne never use the patient's name, you know? And, and this was 1983. So this is, this is before uh, HIPAA was even on the radar. And um, I, I never really liked that. And uh, I remember, um, um, and I hope this doesn't offend anybody, but uh, I remember one patient, she was a lawyer uh, she was actually a, a, a housing activist in, in Brooklyn and um, just a really neat lady, but she was a phaser, <clears throat> so she couldn't talk, uh, but her receptive language was perfect. Like she knew exactly what she was talking about. And I remember the neurosurgeon you know, coming in saying, this is a left cortical brain injury patient with aphasia. Uh, she, uh, obviously she can't speak. And, and then he um, uh, brought some objects in and one of one of them was a was a banana, and he so all these you know interns and residents were around her at her bedside, and uh, he goes, "Show me the banana," and so she goes like this. So that told me so much about her because number one, she had, she knew what the banana was. I mean, she could have, you know, all right, I'll the banana. But she had uh, uh, a sense of humor. Um, she had, uh, uh, as they say in Yiddish, she had what they call chutzpah, you know. And, um, and, and, and she was not, she's not going to be just, just lie there and just be treated like a piece of meat. So, uh, so she, she taught me a lot as well. Um, the, the data sets are important. And um, one of the things I've tried to do is that, um, and, and this is a thing that we, I think doctors in general, we get in this uh, habit of doing is treating, treating patients um, as, as in a black and white manner. <clears throat> so we look at them, they come in, you know, you come in with a stroke or a brain injury or a tumor and epilepsy. And rather than looking at the whole picture, we kind of look at the brain injury. And, and sometimes we interpret everything based on the brain injury. Um, so I'm going to tell you another story. I uh, worked with a young man in Long Beach, <clears throat> and he had a traumatic brain injury. He actually fell quite a way uh, at a construction site. Um, he was from Cleveland. Uh, uh, any people out there from Cleveland or Ohio? Or? Yeah, I like the Buckeyes. Okay. So anyway, he, he was from Cleveland, and, um, <clears throat> and the staff... Uh, you know, called me. They actually came to me and said, Dr. Engel, he's got a serious problem with the patient. Um, he's, um, he's eating dog biscuits. Okay, so um, he, he watches the football game and eats dog biscuits. <clears throat> dog biscuits. He would eat them. Dog biscuits. Dog, dog food. Yeah, dog, dog biscuits. Yeah, dog food. And staff would say, hey, we're going to stop this. We have to set up a behavior, a behavior program. Um, and so I sat down with him and I said, I said, you know, um, what's in the dog biscuits, you know? And he goes, well, I'm a Cleveland Browns fan and the, uh, Cleveland Browns, uh, have something called the dog pound. And it's a, uh, it's an area where, where a bunch of fans sit and they, you know, they bark and they eat dog biscuits. 
And so um, I explained to the staff, I said, I said, you know, um, if if they're not going to harm him, that's, that's a cultural thing that people in Cleveland do for Cleveland Browns. So again, you know, taking, uh, taking a person, uh, putting them in certain contexts, uh, takes them from being a, a brain injured, behavior problem, set up a behavior program to, um, you know, look at them as somebody who's normal for his cultural uh, background, which is Cleveland, Ohio. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, the data sets are important. Um, so one of the things I do is I've collected a lot of data on patients and, um, uh, patients usually don't just have brain injuries. Uh, usually they have other things going on. Um, and that could be substance issues. Uh, it could be sleep apnea. It could be uh, heart disease. And so I think, I think it's really important to get data sets on a broad array of patient groups and uh, figure out, you know, what's really going on, what's really contributing to some of the cognitive issues. Um, one, one of the things I do in my practice now is I, I see a lot of older patients, um, uh, you know, with people who are suspected of having Alzheimer's disease or vascular dementia. Um, I, I actually work with the National Football League treating uh, players who are retired who have uh, uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy or CTE. And, uh, and so I try to... Uh, have multiple data sets that I compare them to to really figure out what's going on. How much of it is the brain injury? How much of it is uh, sleep apnea, which is very treatable? How much is substance abuse issues? And and rather than just you know kind of like putting my blinders on and addressing <clears throat> brain injury or stroke, uh, to look at all the issues and and, and try to help them in uh, multiple ways that I can. Uh, I think that's really important. Um, the other thing, um, and the thing I brought today, um, and, uh, I don't, I don't know how they'll get it from you guys, but we'll, we'll get, we'll get it again. We'll get that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'll yeah. give you the right. Ruben. Um, Ruben. Actually, <laughs> yeah, Ruben, if you take a, take a picture of the, um, of the, uh, uh, uh of the, the handout and then um text it to me or email it to me uh i can uh put it up for everybody here for sure i'll, I'll do that right now it's happening yeah. thanks ryan mm-hmm. it, is it okay, okay yeah. if i get started on it so so one of the things that um um i have i focus a lot of time on um with my patients is Treating the secondary anxiety and depression that occurs because of the brain injury, the life consequences of the brain injury, which could be maybe they've gone through a divorce, maybe they've become estranged from kids. Um, but there's a, as you know, there's very high rates of depression in people with uh, uh, all types of uh, brain injury. So <clears throat> what I did in, and what you'll hopefully see in a minute is uh, put together a, a chart that tells people if they want to stay nice and depressed and miserable, how to do it. So there's one column that you'll see that if you do all those things, you'll stay nice and miserable and depressed and unhappy and uh, your life will be terrible. And then, but then, I, of course, I put another column in that talks about all the things that you can do that are likely to decrease depression and anxiety. And... Um, you know, I've been through a divorce, uh, you know, 12 years ago. So um, obviously I've been through some depression and dealt with that. And, and um, but I, I follow these things. I actually follow these things um, uh, to a T and it really helped me. I uh, got involved in doing missionary work and I've done missionary work all over the world and uh, Nepal and Fiji and El Salvador. Costa Rica, Mexico, um, and that was very, very healing. Um, I, uh, I know you can't, you can't tell now because I, I gained about 25 pounds during COVID, but I, I would run every day. Every day I would run, um, you know, 
rain or shine from the Newport Pier to Balboa Pier and back. And um, no matter what, you know, um, it was, it, it was uh, non-negotiable, you know. Um, I became close with a uh, church family, a, men, a men's group and my church family and the home group. Um, and, um, and then I stayed, you know, very uh, socially active. I would, you know, have get togethers of dinners at my home and whatnot. And that healed my depression. I mean, it, it, it healed me. Um, I, I wasn't on any medications uh, for treating it. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, antidepressants are fantastic. Um, but uh, I use this, this program that you see on the screen now. Um, so one of the things, um, physical, daily physical activity. Um, I, I know that's not easy for some people. Some people are, have orthopedic issues. They have you know, wheelchairs. They're paralyzed on one side. Um, but it's really important to find a way. And, and uh, uh, we have great uh, programs. Uh, actually, uh, Cal State Fullerton has a uh, uh, adaptive kinesiology program that's one of the best in the world. Um, I graduated from there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Saddleback College has a uh, adaptive physical education program. I graduated from there. Go ahead. Yeah, with uh, a pool, pool therapy and uh, adaptive physical education. Uh, Golden West College. So there's, there's uh, an actually Goodwill has a uh, physical education program in, uh, I believe it's in Santa Ana or Anaheim. So what I do is I, I, you know, patients say like, oh, I don't have any place to go or, or it's too expensive. And I challenge them. I, I, I say, well, what about this? Or what about that? Um, I talk a lot about, um, I'm a water guy. I, I love to surf. Uh, I love to swim and surf. But uh, I, I grew up, you know, I, I was born in a fishing village and then moved to the farm in New England. Uh, so I love the water. And I always tell my patients that for a lot of you, uh, gravity is your enemy, right? Because gravity puts more pressure on your joints and your bones, muscles, everything. So the opposite of gravity is buoyancy, you know, and buoyancy is your friend. And that's why I like people to get in the water and, and uh, whether it's, you know, a therapy pool or, or a gym pool or whatever. Um, yeah, it, when, you, when you turn 65, you get Medicare. There's this thing called Silver Sneakers, and you get a free gym mem membership, uh, in case any of you don't know that. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is flexibility training, and flexibility training is to really work on your balance, to work on your uh, flexibility of your muscles, and really to prevent injuries. So I really like that. And that uh, Tai Chi is <clears throat> one example. Yoga is an example. Uh, Qigong, uh, Pilates, which is restorative. So I really like those flexibility exercises. Um, if any of you uh, follow football, you probably know uh, somebody named Tom Brady. And Tom Brady is a, a middle-aged man who is still at the top of his game in football. And, you know, whether you like the Patriots or hate the Patriots, I'm not sure how he's going to fall. Yeah, you, you can't help but admire him. And, and he does not do traditional ballistic exercise. He doesn't really use weight. Um, he doesn't, you know, do the, he uses a lot of uh, plyo, pliability where his, he makes his muscles loose and pliable. He does a lot of work with bands. Um, so I really, I really like that. He uses so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Strength. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah. Uh, mindfulness. Um, so mindfulness uh, training uh, is kind of connected to the spiritual part, right? And and um, I'm always careful with my patients. I you know I happen to be a Christian. That's my belief system. Uh, but I'm very <clears throat> careful not to step on people's toes because uh, you know I um, uh, you know people, patients look at me and say like, well I'm agnostic or I'm an atheist. So I go. Okay, okay. So with mindfulness, it could be prayer, it could be devotion, it could be meditation, it could be uh, listening to jazz music, you know, it could be uh, looking at videos. That there's these uh, meditative videos where they show, you know, you go into a forest or, you know, uh, listening to rain, listening to waves, things like that. Um, but it's, it's just, a, it's a way to, uh, get your mind into this altered state 
where you're just kind of disconnecting from the problems of the day and the troubles of the world. Art, you know, where, where that mindful. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Ryan. I can't. I, I've never been able to get into mindfulness. Yeah. yeah. I've been told by I know Daniel Ignacio says like like you like my meditation <clears throat> like you need to do it and I like I can't I I don't think I can do it because I've never had anybody like sit me down and well like walk me through it. Yeah, yeah. Like I feel stupid because I can't do it. Yeah. How, how old are you? Uh, 35. Yeah, 35. Okay. So when I was 30, uh, I took <clears throat> I took yoga. I said I'm gonna take yoga and I heard it's really good for you. Um, the problem is I'm I'm very competitive. I'm I'm type A. Me too. I'm I have ADHD. I'm, Me too. I'm competitive, you know. <laughs> and so um, like and I'd never done yoga before. So I'd see some dude doing a handstand. I go like, oh, I, I can do that. And I would, I would knock the people over around me. Like I'd fall and it was, just, it was a mess. <laughs> Fast forward 20 years, when I turned 50, I studied yoga again. And I realized it's not a competition. It's not uh, a race. It's not, you know, uh, it's, it's about um, doing something that's difficult but doing it with a smile on your face. And so I changed my, I had to change my attitude and my whole approach to it. And, and the same with, um, uh, I don't meditate, but I pray. Like, so, you know, almost every morning I get up and have my, my coffee and sit at this little breakfast table and read a devotion and do journaling and everything. <laughs> but, but it's a habit that you have to develop. It's not, you know, it doesn't happen like that, right? Habits take time and, it takes a while to, to change that. Um, but I do that, I do that in the morning. Um, um, sometimes if I can't sleep at night, um, you know, I'll take a melatonin, uh, which I, I really like. Uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll just take my phone and I'll put a little sleep devotion on my phone and listen to that. And it lasts about 30 minutes and then I'm sleeping like a baby. Um, so, um, yeah, so that practice is really good. Um, the other part of the spiritual is, uh, you know, I say getting involved in faith-based activities. If you say, well, I'm an agnostic or an atheist, it's really, it's really about fellowship. Um, if you read um, <clears throat> a book by uh, Sanjay Gupta, Dr. Gupta, uh, called Keep Sharp, the, the number one thing that determines healthy aging, and I think health in general, is social relationship. So staying, staying socially connected. And so having fellowship. And, and if you're like, well, I'm agnostic, you know, it, then you know, go to a drum circle in Laguna Beach. You know? uh, go to, go to a, a park, go to uh, Fountain Valley. They, they, have, uh, they do Tai Chi in the park in Fountain Valley. You know, do something where there's fellowship and you're connecting with other people. Uh, because... <clears throat> You know, the more isolated you are, uh, the more depressed you're going to be. And it's just, that's the way it works. And, and um, so, you know, some of my patients say, well, I'm not really a social person. I don't really, you know, I'm kind of like a shy person and all that. Well, you know what? Get over it. <laughs> you know, I, was, I grew up on a farm. I was extremely shy. Um, I happened to be, a, you know, a good athlete. I, I, I played soccer and high school and college, played over in Germany. So people, you know, people would connect with me because I was a good athlete, but, I, but inside I was like, Ugh, you know, they only like me because I'm a good soccer because I could score goals, tackle people and all stuff like that. But, but I got over it. And um, <clears throat> uh, obviously, you know, doing things like that, that's what I'm doing now. You know, when I was 20, I, I'd be scared to death to do that. Um, <clears throat> uh, having animals. Um, grew up in a farm, um, I learned just the therapeutic value of animals. And, and we had horses, uh, we had uh, four horses, we had Angus, we raised Angus cattle, goats, because the goats calmed the horses down, dogs, of course. <clears throat> and uh, one of the things I learned is that um, if you devote some of your time to an animal, a pet, uh, uh, I'm not a cat person, but I understand, I get it, you know, how people love their cats. <laughs> uh, um, then it can be very calming. It can be, uh, it, it kind of uh, takes you out of your troubles for a while and helps you focus on 
you know, this very uh, helpless being, you know, this helpless thing that you need, need you to feed them and pet them and take care of them. So I, I really like um, uh, animals. I like um, horses are very uh, emotional, intuitive animals. So I, I know one of the things that some of you may have done is uh, equine therapy. Uh, and there's um, uh, the Shea Center down in uh, San Juan Capistrano that does uh, equine therapy where you, you know, ride horses or hang around horses. Uh, there's a, a stable in San Juan called Ortega Stables where you actually have psychotherapy uh, in the in the corral uh, where the horses are, and they, they just they sit around like kind of like we're doing here, but imagine I'm not in a room, but we're in a corral and horses are coming around and they're like, oh, there's one, and you start sniffing them and putting their noses on them and all that, and and it, you can't help but you know kind of get out of that whatever state of mind you are. So I really like pets. Um, um, stimulating your mind. Uh, cognitive. That's really important. And um, I was, I always tell my patients, so my mom and dad, uh, they, you know, every night they, they play cribbage, uh, which is a card game with a little board. And I think it's from England. And so everybody in my family plays cribbage. So they play cribbage every night. They have a glass of red wine and then they look in the back pasture and they identify all the birds and they're still very sharp. So what I tell my patients is that, <clears throat> again, interactive cognitive activities are very, very important. Now, patients will come in my office and I'll say, what do you do you know, to keep yourself mentally active? Well, I read. I say, oh, that's good. good. Uh, I do crossword puzzles. That's okay. Um, I play Sudoku. Um, I play solitaire. I say, well, that's, that's okay. That's okay. What's better... Uh, then reading is joining a book club or a book study or a Bible study. And the reason for that is that you get it, get with a group of people. So you're, you're addressing the cognitive issues and the social issues. And, um, and you talk about what you're reading. I, I understand some of you have memory issues and, you know, you'll read something. You won't really remember what you're reading, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter in a way. It's more the interaction and the, social and cognitive stimulation, it's not, a, it's not a, a performance issue. It's not, you know, trying to get a good grade. You know, it's just getting a social uh, component going. Um, I like interactive games. I like card games. I like um, board games. Go ahead, Ryan. I can't take college anymore. Yeah. Because I can't physically take any classes because I've failed every single time. I've tried four times. Yeah. And I've failed every single time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel stupid because of that because I want to go to college. I yeah. want to be the only person in my family that goes to college. Yeah. Yeah. But because of my brain injury, I can't. Yeah. And, and that's, that's kind of a problem in Orange County, isn't, isn't it? Because in Orange County, um, you know, you have to have a nice car. Now it's a Tesla, right? Uh, you have to be good looking. Um, and you have to be well educated. So uh, if you're not well educated, good looking, and if you don't have a Tesla, which I, I don't have, by the way, um, I'm the ugly stepchild of the Tesla called a Chevy Bolt. <laughs> um, you, if you, then then you're you're not really somebody. Now where I grew up uh, in a farm town in a rural town, um, they didn't care how well educated I was. I mean, I remember coming home after I got my doctorate and I went to the little village store and my mom had, of course she had bragged about me. She, you know, this little coffee shop and they go, Oh, Chris, you know, I heard you got your doctorate and all that. They were happy for me and everything. But in my town, um, if you couldn't change the brakes on your car, change your oil, fix a tractor out in the middle of the field, they could care less how well educated you were. So, uh, so I grew up with values that extended beyond education and really had to do well, what can you do on a practical level? <clears throat> so, so in terms of cognitive activities, what Ryan just mentioned with going to college, you know, it might be uh, like, I, I refer a lot of my patients to the uh, RLP program, regional occupational program. Do you know they have a baking, uh, a baking certificate where you can learn how to be a baker. Uh, they have a, uh, uh, certificates where you can become a designer uh, and they teach you how to you know, design 
you know, landscapes and yards and things like that. Um, they teach you how to become a phlebotomist, uh, which is how to do blood draws. And, and these are all six month programs and they're all very practical hands-on programs. I was already in the military, I already know. Yeah. I've already gone through six years. Like paramedic training, right? Yeah, yeah. I was a, I was a quorum. Yeah, so, okay. Very cool, yeah. very cool. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> or, or it doesn't even have to be to that extent. It could be uh, if you're older, like I am, uh, playing games with your grandkids, playing, you know, like, you know, connect four and choose some ladders. Um, um, I have patients with motor deficits. And uh, what I do is I, I have them, <laughs> I, I tell them like, okay, remember when you were a little kid, barrel of monkeys, pick up sticks, <laughs> uh, things like that, where you're, you know, doing a uh, game, you know, with kids or grandkids or just each other. And it works on your motor skills. So um, uh, crossword puzzles are good. Scrabble's better. Scrabble's better because it's interactive. You know, so you're interacting and kind of competing a little bit with other people. Checkers is good. Chess is good. Uh, my wife and I, she's a kings on the corner person. So when we go camping, we play kings on the corner. So nutritional. <clears throat> um, one way to stay nice and miserable is to drink alcohol, high carbs, saturated fats, so cookies, crackers, chips, that'll keep you nice and miserable. Um, uh, and if you want to decrease your misery, um, think about the Mediterranean diet. So lean protein, folic acid, which is kale, spinach, um, uh, chard, or supplements that have folic acid in them. B-complex. Uh, which is to work on stress uh, hormones, things like that. Um, uh, antioxidants, which are all the berries. So if you, if you go to my backyard, um, <clears throat> which is part of my therapy, I have uh, kale. I have like raised beds with kale and chard. Um, I have um, blackberries, blueberries, strawberries. Um, I have um, zucchini and I have, you know, apples, you know, so I have all different organic uh, vegetables in my yard. And part of it is just gardening, lax me. It's, it's like, you know, my little postage stamp of a yard, but it's my little farm on this postage stamp yard that we have in California. Um, but, but we, you know, we uh, eat really well. You know, we, and so that's really important. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to stop. And um, I know, some of you may have questions, so I'm going to be quiet and listen to your questions and see uh, how what I can how I can help. And thank you for listening. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we'll thank you. Brain injury uh, round of applause. Great job. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Ingles. Yeah. Round of applause. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, so we had a couple of questions from earlier in the chat. Um, and so um, Angie said she also has a Chevy Volt, so um, love, <laughs> is the, love is a great hybrid. Um, yeah. But uh, Swanee had asked if you have a website or other uh, contact information that uh, we could uh, access or let everyone else know about in, in our network. Oh, are you asking me about a website? You're your website link, yeah. You could drop it yeah. in the chat. Uh, okay, so um, this, this will sound a little old-fashioned, but I, I've never been in the Yellow Pages. I've never had a website. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, so I, I don't have any of that. I'm, you, I'm, you sound like a very busy guy. You I probably I don't have time to answering <laughs> websites. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Like, um, I, I never, it, in Yellow Pages, or I'm kind of dating myself, but Yellow Pages, I, I kind of like to know where my patients are coming from. So I have a uh, good relationship with uh, neurologists, neurosurgeons, <clears throat> uh, physical medicine doctors, case managers. And so I, I kind of know where people are coming from. Um, and and it's, in terms of website, yeah, just what, what was your first name again? Bruce. Bruce. But like Bruce said, like, you know, um, it, you know, if I don't keep up with the website, then people are going to get upset and mad at me. 
So, so I don't have any of that stuff. So. Well, we do have your contact information. So I can get that to Daniel. Yeah. And he'll, yeah. he'll send it out the email. Yeah. And I'll, I'll leave a couple cards with uh, Ruben. And, um, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So if you can give us the cards and contact information, um, then we'll, we'll be be sure to pass that out as well. Yeah. I, I'm not doing therapy anymore. Um, uh, part of it is I'm traveling a lot. Um, I'm involved with some missionary work and travel and I have four grandkids and I, I go back three times a year to see my mom and dad. So I'm just doing assessments now, just doing evaluations now. So I, I, I wanted to put that out there. So Okay, excellent. And uh, um, yeah, I, I think that was also another one of the questions with Jason um, earlier. So if you have, if you're not doing therapy, um, do neuropsychologists, do they do therapy as long as that you know of? And w if so, would you have any um, directions or guidance in looking for a neuropsychologist that could assist with something more therapeutic than just assessment? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So, um, uh, so what I would do is try to um, number one find somebody who's close to you. You know, because uh, driving is such. Uh, or, you know, driving in Southern, Southern California is miserable. So find somebody who's close by. Um, not always, but usually it's the younger neuropsychologists are doing therapy because they're trying to build their practices. And, um, and, and that could be a very good experience, you know, so um, uh, check out clinics. I mean, St. Jude's has a outpatient uh, rehabilitation clinic. Um, uh, Saddleback uh, has one. Um, Mission, Mission Hospital has one. So look for, look for hospitals that have outpatient rehabilitation programs. And oftentimes there'll be a neuropsychologist attached to that. So. Okay, great, great. Um, Bruce, then, uh, oh yeah, Bruce. go ahead, Bruce. Uh, you're not. You you you've done a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. You know, for what reason would one of us call you? You know, um, mainly what I'm doing now is diagnostic work. So uh, patients uh, call me to. Uh, kind of find out how they're doing cognitively relative to their age, uh, where their strengths lie, uh, any problem they're having. Um, a lot of my patients who have had brain injuries a while ago worry about developing dementia because there's an inc increased risk factor of dementia following brain injury. And so um, a lot of times I'll reevaluate them and uh, I have databases on head injury and the different kinds of dementia syndromes. The question that I have yeah, yeah. Is, is, is there an increased risk of dementia because of a brain injury? There is, there is. Um, you know, honestly, I would say six times, six, seven times out of 10, when I evaluate that person, I, I, you know, what I find out is that, no, no, you don't have signs of dementia, but yeah, you have, still have the same residuals from the brain injury that you probably had years ago when it occurred. So usually it's, it, it becomes more of a reassurance, um, but some of them do develop dementia. Like some of my um, uh, NFL players, uh, you know, a, a number of them do do develop dementia. So uh, you know what I mean? And then uh, Daniel, I know there's some other questions, but real quick on that topic, um, we do, we have had people ask questions on, first of all, what is a way to possibly find out if they have while still alive, I know it's the last <clears throat> time. Yeah. But also on that topic of the possibility of dementia or early onset dementia, what would you suggest to try to prevent or to try to do anything you can to prolong your, your wellness? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, part of it depends on the type of dementia it is. Um, uh, but with CTE, what I've found is that uh, it's really important to get a baseline exam on a patient. Um, so my football players, um, if it's if they're more recent players, then they they will have done something called impact, which is a uh, uh, computerized study um, part of preseason, and then I can repeat the impact testing and compare the data. Um, if they're older players that played before impact was used, I do a baseline, 
And then I have, have them come back in a year or two and do a follow-up with an alternate form of the same test. And then I can, with those two data points, then I can see if there's a, a progressive deterioration. Does that make sense, everybody? Or? Yes. Yeah. And, and so great. And so um, another thing that you had mentioned earlier, Dr. Ingalls, was that uh, you had done a lot of uh, uh, you had done some training work uh, at UCI uh, with some epilepsy and post-traumatic uh, post-traumatic seizure activity. And so um, there are a couple of survivors here, or there are a couple of uh, thrivers, right? Brain injury thrivers. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, brain injury thrivers here here um, that do have a management of kind of post-traumatic uh, seizure activity. So what would be some of kind of your uh, advice uh, in potentially managing future seizures? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So um, what I do is, you know, when a patient comes in uh, who has epilepsy is I evaluate them. Um, but what I'm really looking for is I'm trying to, I'm trying to localize where the epilepsy, epilepsy is in the brain and if it's consistent with their brain injury. And like most of the time, epilepsy seems to cluster in the temporal lobes, the two temporal lobes, um, which are, you know, if you, if you follow your ear in, those are the temporal lobes, you know, um, but not always, sometimes it's in the frontal lobe. And <clears throat> depending on the severity of the epilepsy, um, I look at how, how much of an impact epilepsy has on the cognitive deficit, because remember every uh, generalized tonic clonic <clears throat> uh, is a, it causes oxygen deprivation in the brain. And so if you have a lot of them, that in addition to the brain injury that caused the epilepsy is causing further damage to the brain because of lack of oxygen. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things I do. Um, and then the other thing I do is I try to educate them on what that part of the brain does, uh, what, is, what role it plays in thinking, and, uh, and then maybe refer them to uh, cognitive rehabilitation specialists, um, you know, things like that to kind of help them address that area. Um, I also work a lot with Coastline College, which is, is, a, is a wonderful program in Newport Beach. It's, it's kind of like the best deal in the country for cognitive rehabilitation. Um, so uh, I had a bad, a very bad experience there. Yeah, yeah. It came out three times. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because of a woman named Kim Peterson. Yeah. I'm going to say she is the devil. Yeah. Yeah. because I told somebody that I tried to kill myself yeah. once, and instead of trying to get the help, she just went on and said, hey, Ryan, you're, you're kicked, out. Or yeah. kicked out of the program. Yeah, I mean, it's not for everybody. I mean, uh, you know, there's no one size fits all for people. And, and apparently it's better now, yeah. now that she's gone. Well, no. So, um, yeah, so that's, but gosh, any other questions or can you fix this? Uh, other questions. Like, perfect. Thank you very much, Dr. Ingalls. Um, other hey, other hey, questions. Hey, Gus, did you have a question? Yeah, I did. Um, actually, right. I was gonna, I was gonna ask um, kind of the group for any recommendation for books, but I've been I've realized that I've really been struggling with um, ADD. Um, I realized it's been an issue for a long time. I'm epileptic, by the way. Um, okay. but it's, I'm about, I'm almost five years out, um, from my TBI and it's definitely gotten worse. And, um, I just started taking Effexor. Yeah. Um, I just started taking that, but I don't know. And I'm on like a minimum dose, but I'm kind of, you know, trying to figure out what I can do about it. Cause I feel like, um, I don't know, I guess uh, I'm exploring going the medication route. Yeah. So I, I, I really like um, neurologists and behavioral neurologists to manage brain injury medications. I, I don't have anything against psychiatrists, but I think neurologists, especially behavior neurologists, just have more thorough training. Um, so I usually, my patients, I usually have neurologists that help them do the, the medication management. Um, so. Okay. Yeah, because my, my neurologist who, uh, I mean, I guess I've never really heard about behavioral med um, neurologists. 
I know that like one I had didn't really specialize in seizures and it made sense after a long time, but um, yeah. but my, mind, sorry. Oh, keep in mind, take us like we have a very good epilepsy program at UCI. Like they're amazing. You know? So, and I'm not saying that because I work with them, but uh, they're just you know they're they're amazing people. Yeah, yeah. I know because you mentioned you have a ADHD. So I, was, I guess I was curious in how you've been able to manage that and be as productive as you are. Yeah. Well. Um, you know, it, it creates stress some, sometimes on me, but um, I have a support staff that kind of <laughs> buoys all my problems. So I have a really good administrative assistant. I have a great secretary, great billing person. And what I've done is built, built a team around me to uh, cover for my weaknesses. And um, that's what I've done. Um, I exercise. So in terms of the hyperactivity, I... Um, work out every day. Like I'll leave, I'll go, um, I'm going to go surfing for a couple hours. Um, and then I, I actually like having it, believe it or not. I like, it, it makes me more productive. Uh, it, I've taken some risks that a lot of people wouldn't take. I mean, coming from a town of 3000 and coming out here to California and setting up a practice where I knew nobody, uh, I climbed Mount Everest in 2015. Um, I've been, you know, I've been in the, military uh, section of the, the Great Wall of China. Um, you know, I scuba dive with sharks and Fiji. And so I kind of like it because it, it makes me do stuff that, you know, if I didn't have the ADHD, I'd be like, oh, I better not do that. I could, I yeah. could die about whatever, you know. So I actually like it. But, okay. But it also- well, actually, that's funny you say that because I, I, I surf too, but um, I always tell people like my, I love snowboarding because that's kind of my true Zen where that's the only, like when you're surfing, you got to watch out for people yeah. You're sitting waiting for sets or whatever. And you're kind of, you know, there's a lot of time for self-reflection, yeah, <laughs> but yeah. I love snowboarding because I can, I've been doing it for so long that I, I can just let go. Yeah. And yeah. like, I don't really have to think about it uh, yeah. so much. And that's like, I realize, yeah. wow, I, I don't know. It's gotten to be more and more like that. Cause that's, an ability that I never really lost as a result of my TBI, but so yeah, I mean, exercise, yeah, I'm I'm all about it too. So I don't know, that's that's good to hear about that part. So, um, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I, I don't want to keep everybody too long. I know um, I'm, 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 I've run out of time, but uh, I I'm really glad I got to come and talk to you guys and meet some of you directly. And uh, too. Uh, so thank you for thank you for having me and. Uh, yeah. You know, keep it keep up yeah. the good work. You know, keep Thanks. keep coming keep coming to the support group because it's part of that social networking. So absolutely. And so uh for um you, Dr. Engels, we have re- greatly appreciate your time. Would you be um open to answering just a couple more questions? Oh, of course I would. Yeah, of course I would. Yeah. Okay. Great, great. Uh yeah, so we have a question here from Swanee. Oh yeah. Um, actually, I I had a earlier question in the chat to Daniel about um, caffeine um, increase if it increases anxiety in people with TBI. But I also had another question about <clears throat> which I feel is important um, for me as a woman. But since you have extensive experience with several different um, age groups and individuals with TBI, I was wondering if um, it's if like I'm in my latter forties and um, for me, I find that like times of the month with my TBI compounds like emotional issues that are already um, challenges with my TBI, but also um, like brain fog issues, um, confusion, decision making. Like, is that have you found that in um, older age groups of women as well yeah. who have TBI and dementia? Okay, because I thought, <laughs> am I just going crazy? Or no, no, that was <laughs> yeah. great. Great question. Um, so, um, so, so obviously there's there's uh, pre perimenopause, there's menopause, and um, when women hit their 40s and early 50s, um, my, my wife's uh, just turned 50, so she, she's kind of going through that right now. Um, that can uh, that that by itself can cause a constellation of cognitive and emotional symptoms, 
And so you want to, um, you know, you want to have a really good OBGYN working with you. Sometimes they need to team up with a neurologist or a psychiatrist with your meds. Um, some patients can't uh, do estrogen um, therapies because they have that fraxin gene, the breast cancer risk factors. So, you know, you have to really work with your uh, OBGYN on alternatives to that, which there's a number of um, uh, supplements and non-medication supplements that they can help you with. Um, and, then, and then the other thing is just, um, just being aware of it and just, um, you know, being honest with, you know, friends, partners, family, and just saying, hey, hey, this, you know, I'm coming into, I'm coming into my cycle. Uh, I got, you know, if I act a little wacky, that's what it is. And then, and then most people are understanding, like, you know, um, you know, my wife, she gives me a heads up saying, honey, okay, next week is, you know, when I'm going through my cycle. And so if, if I kind of like bite your head off a few times, understand. And I, I get it. I mean, I, you know, I have sister growing up and, you know, two daughters and, you know, so, um, yeah, so try to do that, but also, um, exercise is very good for perimenopausal symptoms. So moving, keep moving and grooving. And that's some reason that clicks those endorphins in the ear and it will help you. So. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, great. Uh, and then uh, Megan G had a question here regarding um, uh, some cognitive questions here. Yeah. Sure. So, um, hi, I'm wondering what I can do for um, cognitive flexibility issues. So uh, I did some neuropsych testing and I, and I know I also asked that neuropsychologist, he said, you know, doing things maybe in a different order or taking a different route, you know, to work or driving, but I, I work at home. And so I'm kind of thinking stuff inside the apartment that I can do um, that could just increase that overall? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, do you mind, what do you do for work if you don't mind my asking? I'm a broadcaster on Twitch, so I basically I play video games and interact with people oh, online, okay. virtually, yeah. Yeah, great, great. I, I mean, that in itself really works on mental flexibility, right? Yeah. So yeah. Your, your vocation actually addresses that, so right. I think that's really important. Um, I think... You know, some people they'll say like, "Well, should I brush my teeth with my opposite hand?" Yeah. <laughs> do this, do that. I don't. I don't believe so much in that. I I really like structure, and um, uh, part of what I want to tell Pecos is that I, you know, I have a routine. Um, I, you know, some people say like, "Oh my gosh, that sounds so boring," but but it's my routine and having a routine, having structure, having um, knowing what your span of attention is, and trying to work within that span of attention. So, um, so I, I, right now I work uh, <clears throat> four days a week and I work three weeks a month. So I take a week off every month, uh, get away. I went to you know Germany um, two weeks ago, uh, went camping last week. Um, and so, and I know everybody can't do that. And, you know, I'm very blessed to be able to do that, but I really try to balance my time and structure uh, my work schedule and that seems to help quite a bit. So that, that's how I would approach it, Megan, is uh, really uh, looking at the structure. Um, and, and then if, you, if you, you're able to do this, bring in support people, like bring in some support people, which like uh, it could be an intern, it could be you know, somebody that's interested in your field and have them help you. Because I, I, I couldn't do what I'm doing without my staff. <laughs> I, lo I love my staff. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, you're welcome. Absolutely. Yes. So thank you. Right. So getting those structures in place, the routines, support persons really to help with with that. Um, Excellent. So Veronica has a question. Veronica. Uh, yes. Good. Good morning, Dr. Engels. Um, I want to, I guess, share briefly uh, if, to say that what you said about psychiatric medications. Um, I guess I had them and I'm totally against it. Also, because I was more like a zombie when I was with those, you know, trying to, you know, be a, not depressed and then it, to help to sleep and this and that. So uh, I finally stopped all of my medications. Uh, my injury happened eight years ago. So I stopped my medications about uh, about seven years ago. I, I didn't take them that long because my son was telling me how I was looking actually worse. And um, 
and I actually what it helped me I, I start changing my diet from vegetarian to vegan and that's how I start getting better but I do have a question doctor I do have sleep apnea and problems breathing and which is the best doctor to see for sleep apnea because it's really really bad yeah yeah so um first of all uh the memory loss caused by sleep apnea the short-term memory loss is as bad as Alzheimer's disease so it's it's not something to fool around with so um there are uh actually sleep disorder specialists and there's sleep disorder clinics um i like that approach because that's all they do. That's all they do is work with people with sleep disorders. They have the insulin. Uh, they have the infrastructure in place to do the sleep study. Um, they, they're up on the current CPAP technology. I understand that CPAPs aren't for everybody, and there are some other approaches, but, but CPAPs, they, they work really, really, really well. And... Um, uh, so, and then, and then the obvious things like you know, if you drink a lot of alcohol, that makes the sleep apnea worse. Obesity makes it worse. Uh, sedative makes it worse. So all those things, um, you know, try to modify some of those uh, behaviors that uh, are are making a bad situation worse. So. Thank you, thank you, doctor. And just my last question: Do you take medical or different kinds of insurance? You know, you know, actually. Um, I do work with Cal Optima and I work with a couple doctors group like um, Memorial Care Medical Group, uh, Monarch Healthcare, which is now Optum. Um, and I do see some of the medic Medi-Cal uh, patients through those programs for Thank assessment. You. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you for your help. Thank you, doctor. Uh, yeah. yeah, great. And a great uh, thing there with the sleep apnea. I mean, we were talking about that before you came in. Kenneth was having issues with, uh, you know, he's talking about wearing the CPAP regularly. Um, yeah. And then uh, we had a, a question from Susie, and I see you there, Bruce. Did you have something related to this? Susie? No, no, Bruce. Oh, Bruce. Bruce, you have a question. Bruce. I got a you question, Dr. Engel. Yes. What does that stand for? Uh, oh, boy. So. You're catching me off guard, Bruce. I'm <laughs> having a, uh, a senior moment. But what it is, it's a uh, machine that uh, provides regular flow of oxygen air uh, to the pulmonary system while you're asleep. Because in sleep apnea, uh, including obstructive sleep apnea, people will snore, they'll stop breathing at night. So the CPAP helps give you a regular flow of air. And it's, it's, oh. it, it, it can be magical. I mean, it can be amazing. There you go. I know what it means. Con continuing yeah. Yeah. positive airway pressure. Oh, That's thanks, Daniel. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, Susie, you had a question there, Susie? Yes. Hi, Dr. Ingalls. Good to see you Hi. again. Hi. Um, first off, Dr. Ingalls, thank you so much for your excellent presentation and again for all your time. Um, oh, if any of you ever need, um, a neuropsychological evaluation, be sure to go see him. I'm actually one of his patients. I totally recommend him. But um, what I was wanting to ask you is I have a dear friend who I've known for about a dozen years, and he is 70-something, uh, 70 74, I think, just recently had a stroke, blind in one eye, and I'm, as you know, um, having acupuncture three times a week still. Um, mm -hmm. And I was recently told by her that um, if he doesn't get treatment soon, he was supposed to fly um, to Cuba and his wife put it off for work, which is for her, um, to get treatment for him. And now he's getting very, very hostile, yeah. which is understandable. Um, yeah. But if he doesn't get treatment soon that the effectiveness of acupuncture is not going to be as effective um like in a matter of like a year and it's been several months and yeah. is that tr if is that true of all treatments or how does that work i'm not that familiar yeah. with strokes and i know a lot of here or not i didn't have a stroke but 
a lot of people here in this group have had strokes. Can you yeah. talk to that, how that works? Yeah, it's, um, I mean, I'm not an eye vision specialist, but I, I think with, um, with, with the eye issue, I mean, seeing a really good neuro-ophthalmologist um, is, is where you want to start. Um, and then the neuro-optometrists are really good at doing vision rehab. Um, but I think starting out with a really good <clears throat> diagnostic exam with a neuro-ophthalmologist. Um, as far as acupuncture, I mean, we don't, we don't really know how it works or why it works, um, but it does, it is, it can be highly effective. Um, I'm not sure that uh, early intervention is, um, that it has to be early intervention, um, you know, because um, I've had patients several years pro post who had different pain syndromes or anxiety and responded well to acupuncture. So I'm not, I'm not sure about that, but um, okay, I, I, I don't know a lot of the research literature on that. So I, I can't really answer your question. <laughs> okay. What about strokes in general? Um, I'm just concerned that he's going to give up if he yeah. doesn't get treatment soon. And I sent them all kinds of literature, but I'm worried he's just going to give up. Yeah. Well, you know? um, with left hemisphere, the left hemisphere stroke, they're very prone to depression. He uh, is so depressed. Uh, yeah. And if it's a right hemisphere stroke, uh, patients are be, tend to be very unaware and they, they don't think they need any help. Uh, oh, and I'm yeah. general, and I apologize for generalizing like that, but uh, yeah. So if, if it's on the right side of his brain, he may just be, you know, what? I don't need your help and I'm fine. And, and, you know, it's the family that suffers. Um, and if it's in the left hemisphere, the left frontal lobe, um, he might be suffering from depression. And so that if you go back to that handout that, you all saw, you can see there's that, you know, inertia caused by the depression where the depression doesn't want you to do anything. And so, uh, yeah. I'll send it to him. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Yeah, and um, there were uh, questions from earlier. So we had a question from Jason in regarding to, he's got five years of like neuropsychological reports. And so um, over five years, um, and so, of course, it's a lot of data and a lot of jargon that may not be completely accessible for a person. And so, yeah. would it, would it, would that be a potential service of like going to a neuropsychologist with the five years worth of reports to get some kind of interpretive assistance? Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, like every neuropsychologist uses a different set of tests to evaluate people. Um, what, what I've done is I've, I use a, um, some of the primary testing I do has four forms to it. So they're repeatable and you can compare the data directly. Um, I get a lot of referrals uh, from patients who have seen other neuropsychologists and sometimes it's hard to match the data up uh, because you know they have different norms and standardizations and all that. Um, but usually if somebody has had that many evaluations uh, the first thing, thing I do is I'll say, you know, send me the report, let me have a look at them, and uh, it might not even be necessary to do another one because, uh, you, you know, testing testing's okay, but it's really the treatment that is generated by the testing that is a solution. I mean, the test data is just data, um, but it's, um, you know, are you doing the things that have been recommended? And that's usually... Uh, I, I might not even do any testing and just say, okay, so-and-so recommended this, this, and this, and you're doing it. Well, no, I'm not doing it. Okay, you don't need an evaluation. You need to start doing that. So that's how I, that's how I would approach it. Okay, perfect, right? So those important oh, cowboy logic. <laughs> <laughs> perfect, perfect. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and then we had a question from Tamara. Um, hi, yes, um, thank you. I saw Dr. Ingalls for my neuro testing, uh, I guess like a year and a half ago, and I'm two years into my TBI. I actually have a number of questions. Um, everything from, and I know you sort of addressed the light therapy and not being a neuro op optometrist or ophthalmologist. 
Um, but is there anything you can speak to about infrared and a new study out of Harvard about pulsating light, reversal of dementia, and this infrared therapy light caps on the brain? Do you have any familiarity with that and the power of light and healing? And then I have like three more questions. Yeah, I, I, yeah Tamara, I, I don't really know about that. I mean, I know um, um, like Harvard of the U are doing a lot of studies on uh, using uh, light lasers or pain management, different kinds of things, but I'm, I'm not really familiar with that. So I can't, I can't really answer that. Yeah. Okay. So there's sort of new studies, um, as well. So, um, hopefully more will come out positive on that. Um, yeah. and then NAD, that supplement, do you have any comment about NAD and brain healing The in, uh, whatever it is called, um, I don't know the abbreviation is NAD, like N acetylcysteine sorry it's uh, a supplement nac is it NAC? yeah well there yeah. yeah you're right it's nac i apologize um yeah. nac yeah well it, it's used for a lot of things um actually um they found that they're, they're actually using it with covid uh, uh covid prevention and covid therapy um it's used with um uh, some obsessive compulsive symptoms like picking disorders, things like that. Um, so it, it's it's one of those supplements that does a lot of different things, but we don't really we don't really understand fully how it works. Um, but uh, yeah, I've had patients that had uh, they were doing kind of like uh, picking and hair pulling that uh, responded very well from it, um, and, and did they didn't require um, OCD medication. So. Okay. Yeah. I, I started taking it in the evening and I can't put my finger on it, 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 some slight, slight improvement. And which leads to my next question about slight, slight improvement here. Finally, at, at year two, which is the normal sort of TBI or typical balance, dizziness, overstimulation, really any interaction socially of what, you know, I just overstimulated in every way with noise and sound and light and people um, still at year two, but there's been some slight sort of like um, there's something I can't put my finger on where I'm a little bit letter, better, like I, I, I exhaust easy a lot. I like the symptoms are all still there, but somehow I feel a little bit let, better, but everything still happens. The migraines, but so, I can't put my finger on it. Can you, I know that sounds crazy, but how do I gauge when I'm better? Because I was thinking, well, maybe I should come back and see you. And I asked insurance and they improved. Like I want to test again. I mean, I got like a 20% or something on math. And I used yeah. to be smart. And so now I'm afraid I'll get disappointed if I come back and test with you and I'm still dumb on the yeah. test. But, but how do I know well, and how do I not get disappointed? And when is it right? And how do you tell if you're getting better, but all the symptoms are still there? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah no, it makes total sense, Tara. I mean, I think one thing is, um, w one thing I've noticed with my patients is that getting better, is, 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 you know, human nature to compare yourself to before the brain injury. And so as you're getting better, there's this dual conflict where you're looking back, well, before my brain injury, I could do this and this and this and this, and I was doing this. And so you're, you're always gonna feel like you're falling short if you do that comparison. Um, if you look at, what I try to have my patients do is, is look at how are you doing right after the brain injury and how are you doing today? and and, and try to be as specific as possible about, oh, my energy, you know, I can, I can concentrate for, you know, 40 minutes now. And before it was five minutes, um, my, my mom fractured her neck uh, two, a, a year and a half ago. <clears throat> She's 88. And um, she almost gave up. She, she was like, Chris, I can't, you know, I, I can't do anything. I can't. You know, I, I have no energy. I go, mom, you're deconditioned. You know, you've been I fractured your neck. You were in a neck brace for, for six months and you haven't been able to do anything. So I said, get on your bike and start riding. And she started out, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes. She's riding six miles a day now, you know? So I think those concrete indicators have some concrete indicators where you can see, oh yeah, I can, I can do this for this period of time. And uh, because otherwise it's easy to get frustrated and, and depressed and then the depression will say, oh, camera, just give up. Just give up. 
none of that's going to help you. And if you succumb to that, then you're going to get worse. So really fight that, fight that kind of that uh, uh, current, that, you know, depressive current, uh, and, and uh, it, it just keep, keep going. You know? Um, okay, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, tracking. So yeah, that makes sense. Tracking like my other symptoms, I can see yeah. it. So yeah, I hadn't thought to track. I, that's helpful. Thank you. And awesome about your mom. I mean, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah, that's, um, that's that fantastic. Really awesome. I mean, um, I, I, and I, so how is it time to come see you again? I mean, and, and clearly, I'm one of those that has a zillion questions and is that something you just take an appointment for for these like i see this research i get so hopeful i'm looking for something i want to be better um when do we come see you other than testing and when is it time and how will i know it kind of varies patient to patient but um it it, it varies so i think um i I think maybe um email me um send me a private email and um, I can look at your data and look at when I saw you, and then we can we can kind of email back and forth and talk about that. So. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Sound good? And, yeah, yeah, and I feel like you're just like the only doctor that's ever got it, that ever really understood TBI. So thank you, thank you, thank well, you. There's very good neuropsychologists around here. So, um, but but thank you. That that feels good. Thanks. Yeah, perfect. And so. Uh, yeah, and then we had uh, Daniel had a question. Uh, sorry. Okay. Daniel, go ahead. Daniel, and you're muted. You just, yeah, you're muted. Yeah. I'm sorry for that. I was with the GDI. I was muted, I guess. Yeah, it's okay. Your question, sir? My question is what medication should I be taking for my ADHD diagnosis? The very depressive disorder diagnosed and other mental illness. What medications would you recommend? Yeah, so so um, I'm not a medical doctor, so I'm not a physician. So what I would do is go to your physician, Daniel, um, and, and you could, you know, if you have a neurologist, that's a great place to start um, to talk to them uh, about it. Um, make sure the pr- your primary care doctor is involved. Um, because, it's really you know, not because. My PCP does not know what she's doing. She, 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 um, she was a resident last year, so she's still very new. I was the first and only brain injury survivor. Yeah, so, so uh, I would try to get a neurologist involved, Daniel, um, because they would be the best person to address that issue. And because, and, you know, there's so many stimulants that they use for ADHD, and, you know, each of them side effects and they can interact with your other medications. So get get a neurologist. Yeah. Okay, what is your email address? Did you mention something about corresponding with your email? But I don't think we have a email address. We'll, we'll get we'll get information out to you guys, Daniel. Don't worry. Uh, we'll get that information out to you, sir. Um yeah and then uh next we have uh Kenneth has a question here about um yes. question. My um, question pertains to, pertains to my activities at the YMCA. I am a retired mailman that's always been active. I played four sports for four years on the varsity level in high school. And, and now I'm wondering if I go back to the Y, can I get back on those machines and do exactly what I used to do? Or do I have to decrease that? Okay, that's a great question. So what I typically do, Kenneth, is have um, – I would have you see a physical therapist and just have them do an assessment on you and you talk to them about what you want to do, what you used to do, and they'll kind of gauge um, how to get you started and then how to ramp up your program. Because, um, you know, um, like I'm 64 and, you know, like I, I can't do what I did 20 years ago. I'm I, I hurt myself. Yeah, yeah. So I would, I would um, get a referral to a physical therapist and have them do an assessment, check your balance, check your strength, and then and then have them uh, put together a program for you. Sound right. good? Sounds good. Now, yeah. also, I I used to always walk six miles a day after work. Um, I think someone answered the question uh, via text earlier. 
I wanted to go back to doing it, walking my six miles, but I'm using a walker. I can't walk yeah. without the walker. Yeah. 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 And, and uh, now they have those walkers with little seats in them. And so you can walk, you know, you can walk a mile and then you know, if you're tired, you can sit down to rest and then turn around and walk back. So I really like those um, seated uh, fat tire walkers with the uh, right. seats. But, yeah. if I can, but if I can walk the whole six miles, then don't worry about the sitting down part, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You could, but maybe get a physical therapist to have a look at you first. Okay. Yeah. Great, great question, Karen. Um, yeah, uh, Michelle had a question there. Oh. Yes. Well, we're the same age. <laughs> so I remember a lot of the old days, just like you do. My injury happened when I was 12. And of course, it was oh. not diagnosed. So oh. I've, li I've lived with it and I've been to probably 60 doctors trying to figure out what the hell, and I wanted to use a much stronger word, was going on. And I, I basically have scrambled like climbing up a cliff on my fingers and toes. And I have no diagnoses. I have no data. I'm just kind of sitting here, not knowing yeah. what to do, where to go, how to get diagnosed. I'm sorry, I don't mean to cry. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just, I have lost my whole life. I sit there listening to you. You have a medical degree. You have people who love you. I have nothing because no one could help me. Yeah. Yeah, it's tricky, Michelle, with the early brain injuries because when you were 12, um, and if you're my age, you know, that was uh, over 50 years ago. 1969. And, yeah. And uh, remember, neuro rehab, the modern neuro rehab techniques, didn't, they didn't even start until the 80s. You know, they were brought over by the Israelis. The uh, Israelis yeah. had a lot of uh, TBI patients from the uh, Six Day War with Palestine. Oh, yeah. and, and so all our modern neuro rehab techniques came from the Israeli doctors, uh, Yehuda Ben Hushe and his group. The NYU. I remember. I remember Turkey. them, yeah. And so you were, you know, um, you were in that gap where there, was, there really wasn't anything we didn't really know what we were doing back then you know <laughs> I, I i know that <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and so then you've lived your whole life you know compensating as best you can and doing this and doing that and some things probably work and some didn't but um yeah i think i think some of it is just that uh mm. trauma of not people people not knowing what brain injury was back back in the 60s and even seven. So. Well, yeah, and being told that I was imagining it, I was exaggerating it. No, I didn't have problems with the light, you know, that yeah. type of thing. I still have to do exercises daily to stimulate my yeah. brain to work properly. I had yeah. chronic fatigue. I had um, fibromyalgia. I worked so hard to get rid of those. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. so is there really? anything I can do now? Is there any kind of doctor I can go and see now? Or is it just a waste of time because I'm 65? Yeah, well, I think I think a good... Um, uh, primary care doctor, start with a good primary doctor who has a good gero, gero, uh, geriatric background is a good place to start and, and just see, you know, get a program of healthy aging together and have them look at your exercise, your nutrition. Um, I've done all and, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't um, mean to be short with you, but I've been dealing, as I said, 60 doctors. I'm, I'm just fed up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, so I'm maybe, sorry. maybe maybe we just stop here because I don't think it's it's where you're you're not in the place to help me. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem. Ryan, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm kind of to the point where I my brain injury happened five and a half years ago, and I don't really care anymore. Yeah, like about like anything. What you were saying about what Michelle was saying. Uh, oh yeah, I, I I mean I I think I have. Okay, doctors, but I'm moving in two months with my parents because I've had 20 seizures. And if I can just and interrupt real quick, so, so based on what you're saying and what Michelle was just saying, that sounds like something that we could usually go over when it's just us. Yeah. Sure. You know what I'm saying? Anymore. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Are you saying yeah. that you opened up global? Give your information. Wait. Hold on one second, please. Can you give your information and we'll make sure to connect with Ryan. So yeah. Maybe help Ryan find a direction forward. Is that yeah. good? Uh, right. Can I, if you don't mind my asking, were you injured uh, on duty as active duty? No. Oh, okay. I, I, uh, 
fell asleep at the wheel and fell off the freeway. I had a tree. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and I, I returned for help. The, the, the VA is finally understanding brain injury better. So um, you might be able to access some brain injury resources, even though it didn't occur during active duty. So I would, I would not uh, give up on the VA. For time. Yeah. And then I I'm not. Uh, Daniel, who is the guy who's speaking us, he's actually right now finishing his, his uh, doctorate for the, with the VA. Right oh, now. fantastic. That's great. And what's your yeah. specialty going to be, Daniel? Um, I have, uh, my specialty is uh, neuropsychology. I'll be at um, a neuropsychology fellow with UCLA Brain Sports Clinic <laughs> in September. Oh, and fantastic. Oh, wow. Wow. Well, well, I'd love to talk more with you about that. Yeah. Yeah. I would love that, sir. Uh, that'd be fantastic. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Bruce, I think I saw your hand up earlier. Is that you still have that question, Bruce? Okay, he's good. Okay, excellent. So uh, Kenneth has another question. I think it was about brain fog, right? Is that yeah. right, Kenneth? Yes. Yeah, uh, go ahead and ask it, sir. Well, what I'm, I'm having issues with is hallucinations and stuff. And I just recently hallucinated that I stole a car, came back over to my daughter's house, broke into her house. And then my daughter said, no, dad, you was here all night. You went to the bathroom and then you came out. And I remember when I was kind of like aware of what I was doing, I was coming from the her bathroom area. Yeah. To me, it was yeah. also so, real that I actually stole a car from my, my other place. And I was wanting to go out and check on the person that I thought may have been still in the car. Maybe I hit him upside the head or something. I don't know how I got the car. Yeah. It was also real to me. Yeah. I, I would, um, if, if you have a neurologist, I would. Um, kind of talk to the neurologist about that and have them take a history about, you know, when those started occurring. Um, check your med medicines, because some medicines can affect hallucinations. Um, some diseases, like some, uh, like Lewy body disease can cause hallucinations. So just have a good neurologist check you out, Kenneth. Thank you, sir. Yeah, you're welcome. That's a great question, Kenneth. Yeah, sorry, and uh, you, are you doing all right, sir? Uh, we got a couple more questions, are you okay? Maybe, maybe two more and then I have to go because I, I have to go uh, work out and then I'm going to a concert tonight. So. All right, yeah, I appreciate it, Ben, you're impeding on your workout time. So thank you so much again. So the last two, we have Larissa and Pam. So Larissa, yeah. you have a question? Here? And you're muted, Larissa. Bob, and is there a diet that can help? Oh, You're muted, Larice. I don't think she talks Less fat. You're muted, Larice. That's what the picture is on your phone. Ah, hieroglyphics. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> thanks, the doc. Thanks, Daniel. I hit yeah. that one, but anyway, regardless. So, um, thanks, Daniel. We we walk similar but different paths. Um, I, I think I'm retiring from helping the ADHD because I was a suicide watch for all my buddies after I saved my husband's life and he abandoned me multiple oh, yeah, yeah, question there for, um, for, yes. Yeah, so with the ADHD, one thing that I am recently learning, and maybe you could bring me back to that. Cause that was a piece that, um, I'm sometimes if I can remember to checklist that I did something that day, cause I can't run my five, 12 miles or whatever the hell, you know, but, uh, what can I do? Uh, ADHD checklist, any other tips for when someone else's trauma is, um, triggering mine only I can't go run off the emotional stuff anymore, you know, cause yeah. Of, yeah. I think, I think self-care is really important. So doing a lot of self-care, um, which could be, um, you know, doing like a, a meditative prayer practice, oh. uh, you know, having, having um, healthy people in your life, not just people who are uh, high drama people. I think it's really important to have really healthy people in your life and, and getting that balance going. Yeah, no, uh, I'm good with all that. And you guys are a part of that. And I want you to know that you're part of that. 
Um, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, I, I, I got that. And uh, there's some, um, what I suggest I want to share with you, because those of us that have the 80 shade that wakes us up at night, the ins- insomnia, that's why I was a, such a good suicide watch gal. I love yeah. movies and I'm just, anyway, multiple concussions. And so, uh, uh, shoot, and rabbiting mind. Yeah, but yeah I, I, bringing it back to the moment. Nature, yeah. if you get in water, get, get in water, wherever you are, get in water. Nature just somehow shuts the brain up. Yeah. And yeah. it helps some of us that are frustrated ADHD that yeah. can't go to the concert tonight. Yeah. 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 You know? Yeah. Um, one, more, one more question. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Hi, thank Pam. you. Hi, um, good afternoon. I'm so glad to be here and see everybody. I wanted to thank you, Dr. Ingalls, in particular, what was so helpful was hearing how you do self-care. And um, I just really want to thank you for the information you brought and for um, showing us the um, how it works when we do take care of ourselves. It was inspiring to me. It was my first comment and it really has, that will change my life. So thank you. My second oh my comment God. is will probably embarrass um, Dr. Ignacio, and I apologize for taking this time, but um, Daniel Ignacio will probably um, change the world. And so I want to encourage you guys to connect. Um, that's very selfish on my part, but I think that, that I think uh, I'm excited to hear what would result um, after you guys uh, collaborate. So. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I uh, gosh, I love working with um, younger people who are entering the field and, you know, uh, for selfish reasons and then some unselfish reasons. So that'd be awesome. Yeah. So thank you very much for all your time. Give one more big round of applause. Yeah, thank you, Doctor. Thank you. We love you. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you, Doctor Engels. Thank you, Doctor Engels. Thank you, Doctor Engels. You're thank amazing. You thank you. 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 Thank you.